So the project I'm going to present to you today is called the Salt Creek Memory Project. Um, and it just finished. Like last Friday was our opening night um, at a museum exhibit. And I want to kind of start about the beginnings of the project. So I live um, in Pueblo, Colorado, which is about two hours south of Denver, Colorado. And Pueblo is an old steel, um, steel mill um, community, and there were coal mines in the region. And a lot of people came to live in Pueblo um, in 1870 and 1880. At the turn of the 20th century, you had a huge increase of immigrants come from all over the world. At one point, there were 19 to 21 different languages that were spoken um, in Pueblo, Colorado. The community that I'm going to talk about specifically is a community outside um, of Pueblo city limits, but it sits within Pueblo County, and it's called the community of Salt Creek today. It's also known as um, Fulton Heights, and when people originally moved there, it was referred to as Barrio Salado. Um, so this project started for me in the summer of 2014. Um, I had a student named Jose Ortega who was interested in doing um, an undergraduate research project. And our provost's office um, supplied us with $1,500 for students to be able to do research. Um, Jose is actually from um, the community of Salt Creek. His grandparents um, had lived there, and um, his mother grew up there. So we had some interest um, in the area. We also have a Chicano movement collection at our university archives, or a co um, collection focused on the Mexican-American civil rights movement which we've been working on growing for the past seven or eight years. Um, Jose had originally started out his summer undergraduate research project in our archives. We have a collection of documents called the Louis Lux Garcia Papers. And Louis Lux Garcia was a resident of Salt Creek in the 1970s, and he had been very, very concerned with what he saw as environmental racism. He felt like CFNI, um, the water that had ran through their um, factory that cooled the steel, then ran into the community of Salt Creek. And so he believed that there were contaminants in the water. He was also very concerned because Pueblo, that didn't fit within the, um, the area of Pueblo City, that there was no um, municipal government that was really concerned about what was happening in Salt Creek. So he led a push along with some other community members to um, bring playgrounds into the area, to bring um, fresh water coming into the area, and then also wanting to focus on bringing sidewalks in. So that's how the project really started out. So um, Jose did a series of oral interviews with um, family members of Louis Lux Garcia. And one of the um, requirements of the grant was that Jose would do two community presentations. He would do one at the university in a room a little bit larger than this, about 100 um, people could fit, and then another community presentation in the area of Salt Creek. When Jose presented on campus, he presented to over 100 people in the audience. Um, which was a really ended up being a big presentation, with probably about 50 of them being community members. Um, when he presented to the community, um, there was another 75 people. So it was obvious that there was a desire for people in the community that wanted to share um, their histories. Um, what I would know is that my research specifically focuses on Mexican Americans in the Southwest. And what I found in my research is, is that there's what I usually do research from about 1880 until 1920. There's not a lot of primary documents that focus on the voice of individual people. Um, because of their literacy levels, or they were not usually able to keep their own records. So I usually have to get at my historical documents by reading through um, company materials or other lenses. <clears throat> so as I've done my research, I've really tried to focus more on collecting oral histories of these individuals thinking more from a very selfish perspective of if people would, if we would have the technology to have oral histories, or if there would have been a researcher that, researcher that collected these stories 100 years ago, then I would have a better lens by which to view um, my research subjects. And so these are just images of Jose presenting at our university campus. So after Jose's um, presentation in the community, he had probably 30 people come up to him and said, when's your next presentation? Or there's more to Salt Creek than just the Louis Lux Garcia story, the story of the 1970s. So we started um, having discussions with El Pueblo History Museum, which is a community museum of the Colorado Historical Society, um, also known as History of Colorado. And we sat down with them and said, how do we continue to collect and share these stories um, about people in Salt Creek? So um, we sat down and started planning, and we met with our local library as well. We discussed the fact that what we first needed to do is actually have people sit down and start talking. Um, oral history collection 
I come at it from a very traditional academic perspective, saying, okay, a historical event has occurred, and how do we record those ideas connected to the historical event? I'm also really, really picky about the fact that I want oral histories done in an enclosed room with like two or three microphones with not a lot of outside noise. Um, and I really want um, to be able to record specifically around the historical event because I've been trained to really focus on historical accuracy and um, objectivity. And what I found as I've done oral histories and I've done more community projects is that's not how it works. And if you want to do community projects, you really have to kind of put, set everything aside and say if people want to share their stories, then they need to share it the ways that they need to. And about 19 years ago, I was actually sitting in a classroom. I was probably sitting in a professor's office. And I had this conversation with a professor. And he said, the most important thing that you need to remember is that when you are writing the history of people or you're collecting oral histories, it's important that you don't try to dictate what they share, but that you listen to what their concerns are and their needs are and the stories that they want to tell. And a lot of that came back to me when I was working on this project, again, because I wanted to really focus on making sure that those stories were collected and not being so stuck in my academic framework. Um, so we sponsored in October of um, 2014 a um, memory workshop. And we had, I'm like, this is going to work. Um, <clears throat> we had community members. We had probably 30 to 40 community members that came out. Um, and they sat down and they wrote down their stories and we did a couple of, um, a little bit of filming, but not a lot of um, focus on oral history, just really more of saying we are interested in the story of Salt Creek and collecting the story. So these are just some of those images associated with that. It's interesting, this woman, is, her name is Debbie Baca Duran and you'll see her um, again. So this was October of 2014, and then at the time, the executive director of the El Pueblo History Museum wrote a grant. And the grant that she wrote was focused on this idea called Museum um, of Memory. And so the idea was is that there would be a physical location in Pueblo, Colorado, where people could come and share their memories. And so the idea was focused more on the memory of places rather than focusing on the historical accuracy and the names and dates about um, spaces, but to kind of think of spaces more broadly. Um, she received the grant from Colorado Creative Industries and then um, kind of put together a bunch of other funding sources from the Pueblo um, City and County. Um, also, there was a donation from an, um, a $100,000 donation from um, a family that lived in Pueblo as well. So all this kind of money is kind of put together for this project that we began working on. <coughs> so this past spring, um, in February, we started meeting as a committee, there were four of us initially. Um, there was myself, Jose Ortega, who was an undergraduate student that I had worked with a year and a half ago on this project. Um, there was Kelly Cason O'Connor, who was um, a documentary photographer. And there is um, Sophia, Mural, uh, Sophia Healy, who is a muralist. And we sat down and we had discussions about um, we were going to collect oral histories. Um, the oral histories would then be accessible online. If they wanted to be, they could be transcribed and then put in, in the archives as well. I'm a bigger fan of transcription because I like to come back to interviews 100 years later, and I know that it's easier to preserve the paper than it is to preserve the digitization sometimes. Um, I'm also a Luddite at heart that I'm waiting for the world to end and there's going to be no technology. Um, <clears throat> So we sat down and we said, how do we do this? Because the only person who was from Salt Creek was Jose, and he was a little bit more um, detached from it. He had actually grown up there, but his mother had and his grandmother had. So we sat down and we talked about the fact that the most important piece of the Salt Creek Memory Project was that we wanted to make sure that the people who were from Salt Creek, that their stories were collected appropriately. And we wanted the mural and everything else to reflect their experiences. So we sat down and we had this discussion. We said, we are basically outsiders coming in telling these people that they need their histories and their stories to be preserved. And we don't want to be outsiders, but we also don't want to feel like we're the ones that are telling the story. So what we decided to do is we had a series of six community meetings. And we had three at El Pueblo History Museum and three in the Salt Creek community. And this is before the project ever really initially began. So we advertised the community. We went to the Salt Creek Rec Center. We talked to members of the community. So it was, tons of this was done through word of mouth. Um, one of the individuals who started coming to the meetings was a woman by the name of Judy Baca. And she was from Salt Creek. She was also a university professor who had been interested in preserving these stories for the past 30 years. So she started up this Facebook page. 
And within a week, she probably had 500 members on it. And so it's been crazy because the Salt, um, Salt Creek Facebook page has exploded. There's almost 700 members now. They share three to five posts every single day. As soon as a post is shared, there's like four or five different comments on it. So it's kind of taken on this life of its own, which is what we wanted it to do. We wanted the community to come back and say, this is the history that we have always loved and we wanted to share. So in a series in these meetings that we started having, what we basically did is we sat people down and we said, okay, tell us what your memories of Salt Creek are. Um, and so they just wrote on these big um, pieces of paper. And so you'll see here where it says, Jake Baca and Ben Abeda built a lot of homes around Salt Creek. Um, watching the slag fall at nighttime. The slag is the waste from the steel mill um, that would um, kind of fall. It's, it, would, it's, it was a site that you could see on the horizon um, from the community. Um, my dad built his own well for water. Um, had many outside to toilets. Um, and then the kids would come in and knock stuff down. Um, here's one, the Ojito. The Ojito is a natural spring that existed um, in the community. And before they built wells, they actually got their water from that source. Um, this idea of a sense of community. And over and over again, um, in all of our community discussions, that's what kept coming back up was this idea that Salt Creek was a community and that these people came from Salt Creek. They didn't come from Pueblo. <coughs> Grocery stores became really prominent. There were between seven and 10 grocery stores that existed in Salt Creek from about 1870 until modern day. One of them, Flores Grocery, actually still um, exists today. And Laud Flores was one of the individuals we actually um, had the opportunity to interview. And then you have the rec center here. So a lot of this was just discussion, saying what, what stories um, should be told, how should we be, um, portray these. So after we held these community meetings, then our project team actually grew because we had four of the individuals who were attending the community meetings that decided that they wanted to be part of the project. And they actually signed up and volunteered to collect oral histories. When we originally sat down with the project, our goal was to collect 10 to 15 interviews because we knew that each interview would be at least an hour and we didn't have a lot of extra time to be able to record this. And we knew that with 10 to 15 hours of interview, we'd be able to do um, the museum exhibit. The original space for the museum exhibit wasn't very large, so we were also dealing with um, a spatial um, issue as well. When we were finished with the project, um, this July we ended up collecting over 35 interviews, and the majority of those were collected by community members. Um, so there was definitely a desire from the community to um, share these stories. As we were meeting um, in the community, people started to bring pictures um, from their lives growing up. And so I've kind of given you some of these images. This is a picture of the slag um, being poured. And then this is a picture of the ojito and children coming to the ojito or to the well or the natural spring to be able to gather the water. So again, it kind of started off as people talking and then bringing images in. And then this is a um, picture of um, people at Salt, um, the Salt Creek Rec Center, a group of Boy Scouts, as they're raising the American flag. The interviews right now are recorded. Um, they're up available on SoundCloud. Um, we also did the documentary images, and hopefully everything works OK. And I'll give this link to um, Dr. Rensick as well. And I'll just play a sample. It was interesting because there were six people that were doing the oral interviews. Um, and they're done in all different locations. So there's some that are done in a library. There's some that are doing in the home. When I've usually done an oral interview, it's only one interview subject. What happened in this instance is that people insisted on being interviewed with family members present. And that was something I had never done before. Um, so it was sometimes it was like where there was literally a family member sitting there next to them the entire interview who would kind of interject um, here and there. I did one interview where it was two brothers sitting next to each other the entire interview. And all I could think the entire time is the researcher who looks at this later is going to hate me. Um, but for me, it was really important to have the authenticity of these brothers wanted to sit together and tell their story together. They'd actually been musicians um, that had traveled all over the world together and their father had actually paid um, for a lot of their trips. So I actually felt it was 
natural, it was authentic for them to be interviewed together because that's how they had lived their lives was together. They actually lived in the home that their parents had built. Um, and it was funny because one of the brothers who's actually um, babysat his granddaughter, cared for his granddaughter, so she kept running in and out during the interview. And again, as a researcher later on, I was just, I kept thinking this is a nightmare. Um, but it really added to the authenticity about what was going on. And I'm gonna see if these play, um, but you'll see that they're not very loud. Um, you actually do have to have earphones, but that was one of the difficulties of um, having community involvement was the idea that they weren't as professional as we had hoped that they would be. So let's see if it plays. But you can hear that, that you can't really hear them. Or my mic has um, cut it out. Twin bells. Oh, uh, and who got the bell? She did. She did. I didn't want to press the subject. What was your favorite one? Uh, I don't know. I really, I just kept myself at the game. Uh, Mom showed us how to crochet, so, uh, you know, we did everything. Uh, I hated doing dishes because my little brothers got away with not having to do them until me and my sister moved away and then the boys got to do the chores. Just that, you know, big family, I guess you just tend to have to all pitch in. I ran away from home one day because I didn't want to do dishes. <laughs> So the oral interviews, instead of focusing specifically um, on a historical event, we asked questions more about the community, what the community felt like, um, what sort of um, spaces did these people um, live in. Uh, we also asked them or talked to them about um, where they went to school, um, what buildings they lived in. One of the things that um, kept coming up was this idea that for the children, they had to travel to actually go somewhere. Um, to school and they would end up having to cross this place which was referred to as the black water and the black water was the water that had run again through the steel mill so part of the ditch that they crossed over was actually black they also told stories about folklore of the region um, one was the story of la llorona who is the woman who um, has a in spanish colonial days she's a native woman who has a sexual relationship with a Spanish man. Um, when he marries, he marries another, he marries a Spanish noble woman. So for revenge, she takes her, their two sons and drowns them. And then she's cursed to roam the waters looking for her children. And it's a tale that people, um, parents throughout the Southwest will tell their children to scare them to not want to go outside at night or to stay away from water so they won't drown. Um, people also talked about a lot about um, going to different grocery stores or going to dances um, that occurred at the rec center. So there was this definitely feel of um, community throughout all of the interviews. Um, sports became very, very important to community members. The community of Salt Creek had actually been viewed and still today is viewed by um, many individuals within the Pueblo community as being a backwards location. It was a space that had been um, originally settled by people that were um, from northern New Mexico or people that were from Mexico um, in the late 1870s and early 1880s. And so there was this idea that people that were living there were not as educated as people in the other communities. Um, and so then these are just samples of um, quotes that we would pulled um, and then these became, we put them into the museum exhibit to kind of illustrate some of the oral histories. Um, and then this one again is just talking about <clears throat> that ditch. Again, that ditch kept coming up over and over again. But this just idea of this idea of childhood of people being able to play outside and not worrying about who their neighbors were because they knew who all their neighbors were. They were related to their neighbors. Um, but there was definitely 
a sense of community that had originally come up in our early conversations with Salt Creek was this community where people felt connected to each other. Um, again, this is about football and being of a smaller size. So it kind of the interviews went all over the place. Um, so then what we did um, is after the oral interviews were completed, um, the muralist went through and actually started listening to all of these stories. When we were collecting the oral interviews, um, our documentary photographer, her name was Kelly Kaysen O'Connor, and she had done a series of images before, and this is her website. She'd done a bunch of pictures in Guatemala. Um, and so that had kind of set the context for what we wanted to do, because we didn't want to place the people um, to make it look like they were in poverty. We wanted to really reflect what their lives looked like. So Kelly came through and she took these images. And this is, I, I have some in my PowerPoint, but I just wanted to show you the web page as well. So this is Judy Baca. She was one of the community members um, who um, participated in the oral interviews. This is um, a man by the name of Frank Arona. This is Vera Estrada. She was also one of the um, interview subjects, but she also um, helped with oral history. She collected almost 15 interviews just on her own. And she would actually go in and she'd have two recorders. She had one for the museum to pull all the interview off, and then she kept one for herself because she also was paranoid that things wouldn't actually be recorded or saved. Um, Kelly actually asked the interview subjects. She said, where do you want to have your pictures taken? And again, it was really focusing on their stories, their histories, and to remember the spaces that became important to them. This is the woman I told you at the community meeting. I said, well, you'll see her again. This one is a woman by the name of Debbie Baca Duran. And she came to every single community meeting. And she just really felt like it was really important to tell a story of Salt Creek, but also to tell a story of her family. And she talked about the fact that her grandfather had been living in a smaller community um, further south of Pueblo called Trinidad, and that they had moved to Salt Creek, but that her grandmother had been, her great-grandmother had gotten remarried and her um, great-grandfather was abusive. So her grandfather actually went and picked up the mom and brought her um, to Salt Creek. They talked about the fact that their homes were made of adobe, that they were made of these mud bricks, um, and that each house was built for however many kids lived in the house at the time. And as more kids were born, more rooms were added to the house. This is a woman by the name of um, Consuelo Granillo. And she, um, her father, her grandfather was one of the original um, settlers of Salt Creek. But she also started coming to the community meetings. And she came to the community meetings with her daughters. And she started um, participating in the Royal History Project as well. So it was something that we didn't, like I didn't expect to start seeing these generations of families actually come out. I was really surprised that community members wanted to participate um, in collecting of the oral histories. Um, this was a newspaper article that came out about two weeks before the museum um, exhibit opened. And then I'm going to show you some images um, of what the mural looked like and you'll see the stories of Salt Creek um, start being reflected. Um, in these murals. So this is a piece of the mural. This is um, the story of La Llorona that the muralist kept hearing in the oral interviews. So she wanted her to be reflected um, in the mural. There were tons of stories about the fact that this community didn't have indoor plumbing until the 1950s. And so kids were washed um, in tin basins outside. This came up in at least five to 10 um, of the inter oral interviews. This is the, um, the ojito that, the, again, the muralist heard in probably 15 to 20 um, different oral interviews. And so she wanted that to be represented as well in the mural. I don't know if because the team had a majority of women um, in the participating in the collection of oral histories, we only had one man of the um, six of us that were collecting oral histories, but women's stories came through consistently, the stories of mothers, stories of grandmothers, and the kind of labor um, that they were doing. So here is basically an adobe structure in the background. And then this is an orno, it's um, uh, an earthen oven that they made out of the same adobe bricks that they made the homes of. And then you'll see again, this was this idea that it w while it was a community, there was still rural life and that people um, were supplying their own subsistence. Um, Salt Creek, even today, it's very bright and colorful. Paint houses are painted pink and bright blue and yellow. Um, so that was definitely something as well that the muralist wanted to reflect in the images. <coughs> I 
music and dancing um, was talked about consistently. It was interesting because um, after we had had those initial six community meetings, then we collected the oral interviews, and then we had three community meetings about what the community felt should be reflected in the mural. In total of all the community meetings, we probably had at least between 100 and 150 people come from the community of Salt Creek to give their input um, at different times. After I interviewed the um, Gomez brothers, the brothers that had traveled all over the world um, playing their music, I called the muralist up and I said, okay, like this keeps coming up in the interviews and I don't know how to reflect it in the mural, but music has become very, very important to the community. So this is one of these ways that she reflected it um, in the mural. This is the mural at the very, very beginning stages. So the mural is probably this, almost the size of this entire screen, not, not my PowerPoint, but the entire screen. Um, and so what they did was they took um, sheet metal, and it was, I think, um, four by four pieces that are about 10 feet tall. And then they actually drilled it into the museum. And so the idea is, is that the mural can be movable. Okay? And one of the things that you'll see with murals throughout um, the Southwest and throughout Mexico is that murals are usually painted on walls. And so they're going to get covered over, over time. So the idea was we wanted a museum quality piece to then actually be housed in the community of Salt Creek. Um, so this was up from July until um, a week ago. Um, she was painting it. So she actually went through and she did a PowerPoint projector on this sheet metal and then spent like six weeks drawing everything out and then painting it. And again, it was this collection of stories. Again, going back when we had had the initial discussions, the things that kept coming out was that Salt Creek was very colorful and vibrant, not just in its history, but the colors and the pictures um, were in your mind when you go to Salt Creek. That's what it looks like. Um, <clears throat> we wanted Salt Creek, the mural to reflect this idea that Salt Creek was the community, but we also wanted it to reflect this idea that it still had its Mexican-American roots, that people still refer to it as Barrio Salado. So that's why we kind of used um, both images. So this is the mural, almost finished. And this is the completed mural. This was the grocery store. We had a, at least five or six discussions because there were seven different grocery stores. And we kept saying, we can't put one name on the grocery store because we don't want to offend everybody else who went to the grocery store. So let's just do everything that a grocery store would have but not put a name on it so it could offend anybody's grocery store. Um, so there was a big concern for us if we don't want to offend community members and we want them to feel like they're reflected um, in the exhibit. So then these are the images that Kelly Case and O'Connor took um, Again, so she took them on film. She didn't actually use um, digital. She actually went and actually got old film and like went into the black room, um, into the dark room and everything and processed the film. Um, she matted them and framed them herself as well. Um, the person who um, helped her with all the materials for the um, prints, um, it was all local sources. Nothing was actually shipped out outside of Pueblo, Colorado to do it. Um, again, this is Consuelo Granillo over here, one of the community members. <clears throat> Originally, this um, the mural. This is part of the room where the mural um, is in, and it's probably it's probably about the size of maybe half the size of this room. And that was originally where we wanted the exhibit to go. Um, but what happened was is that because there were so many people that participated in the interviews, they actually had to double the size um, of the exhibit. So the actually museum added a fake wall. So this is where the wall would have ended. And then they added a wall over here to be able to continue to add images on. Um, so the, it expanded beyond what they were expecting. This was the opening night of the exhibit. And so I've chosen some pictures of the people. So this is, I think, it's, um, Patricia Gonzalez. And then that's her. And that's her standing there with her sister. So again, there was this family connection um, throughout the entire exhi exhibit. This is um, Greg Gomez. He was the man who was part of the, um, the singing group as well. And he was taken on Gomez Road. And again, this is the same space where that original picture that came up in the community meeting um, was actually present. 
and this is another um, interview subject. So it was really cool because the interview subjects were excited about seeing themselves reflected at the museum, and they wanted to have pictures by the pictures that were taken um, as part of the project. So this is um, community members at the exhibit. We had almost 150 to 200 people that were present for the museum exhibit opening. And again, generations of people. It was grandparents with their grandkids, um, with their own children, aunts and uncles, tons of people that were present. And then you'll see Vera again, so she was consistent throughout the entire project. Which is, this is not typical for oral history projects. Oral history projects, because they try to be a more objective um, in their approaches, they're not, not as much of a community feel to them. So there are some individuals. It's interesting because this is actually one of my students. Um, her name is Morgan, um, and she um, had a summer class with me. And her father came with her to the exhibit, and she came as a, a, an assignment for the cl my class that she was taking. Um, and she brought her dad, and her dad said, you know, I actually know everybody on the walls because I grew up in Salt Creek, and my dad's from Salt Creek. And so now Morgan's actually working on a project with me this semester to continue to do oral interviews of people in Salt Creek and then connect them through a website um, to the exhibit, the physical exhibit. So that there's a life that's extended beyond just um, the initial oral history project and the initial grant. <coughs> and so again, I wanted to show this idea of this, is, this was the picture that showed up at our table in the initial community meetings, and then this is then Greg Gomez afterwards, right? So you, I, for me, I saw the connections across these six months of planning. This is the original slag picture that was on somebody's cell phone in the community meeting that then ends up being showed in the mural. This is the ojito, right? Just that little scribble on a piece of paper. This is the picture that got brought into us, and then this is how it's reflected in the mural. This is one of the images. Uh, so it was interesting because the photographer, Kelly Cason O'Connor, she took a picture of this um, Virgin of Guadalupe in February. It was her first time she'd ever been to Salt Creek, and she took a picture of it. And so when she was speaking with this woman, she said, well, where do you want, to be, where do you want the, the picture taken? And she said, oh, this is on this bench. So Kelly came to the bench, and there was the picture of the Virgin of Guadalupe. So it was that desire to continue to show that throughout um, all of the images as well. I'm going to kind of start um, summing up now. Um, this was one of the women that I interviewed, and her name was Lucy. Um, I sat with her for probably about 45 minutes to an hour. I asked really open-ended questions, and it started off the interview with, you know, tell me about what you imagined Salt Creek. You know, what are the stories you would tell? Um, what spaces became important to you? And so she was talking about the fact that she had grown up on Placita. She was like one of like 20 children. Um, her father had originally built this adobe home all by himself. And she said it was originally like only one or two bedrooms, and the more kids my parents had, then they added on, so the house ended up being really, really big. Um, <clears throat> she had used an outhouse the majority of her life. Um, when she grew up and got married, she moved about three to five miles away, but she still came home all the time to help her mom raise kids. So when she got married, she only had one child. And she, in the interview, she talked about that. She said, she said, I only had one kid because my mom had so many, I didn't feel the need to have any more. I'd already done my job taking care of kids. Um, and she was there, and her sister was in the interview, and her brother-in-law was in the interview. And she's this little old woman. She's probably 80 or 85. And the interview was kind of coming to a close. So we were really about like 40 minutes in the interview. And she would tell me about her husband who had died um, and how she had met him. And I felt like we were summing it up. And then I asked her one final question. I don't even remember what it was. But she started talking about this guy named Joe. And I'm like, well, who's Joe? And she got this smile on her face. Again, she's 85 years old. <coughs> and she said, well, he's my friend. I said, OK, so there's this guy named Joe, and he's your friend. I said, well, how do you know Joe? And she said, well, I know Joe from Salt Creek. And I said, but you moved out of Salt Creek like 60 years ago. And she said, yeah, well, I know him from before that. I knew him when I was a teenager. I said, but you got married when you were like 18. And she's like, yeah, well, I, he was kind of my boyfriend before my husband. And I said, so there's a guy that exists now in your life that was your childhood boyfriend? And she said, yeah. She said, Joe used to come, and he'd throw pebbles at my window at night. And I would go sneak out, and I would go and talk to him at the outhouse. 
But Joe was too afraid to ask my dad for permission to actually date me, and his sister decided to move to Seattle, Washington, so he left, and my, this guy ended up marrying as soon as Joe left, went to my dad and asked for permission to date because he knew Joe was gone, and that's the guy I ended up marrying. I said, okay, so you were married to this other guy for like 50 years, and then he died, and she said, yeah, and then Joe came back about 10 years later and called me up. I said, so Joe is now your boyfriend that you knew from your teenage years. And she said, yeah, and he takes me to breakfast, and he brings me coffee every day, and we go to dinner three to five times a week, and he checks it. And I was, like, I was totally like flabbergasted because my idea of the interview was about let's talk about these spaces and these locations, but I didn't think that we would have these stories come back. Does that make sense? So that for her, her memory was about these spatial locations, but it was also about her relationships that came, it was like this relationship came back to life 60 years later. And so for her, her current boyfriend as 85 years old was a guy that she had known from Salt Creek. And this was just something that we kept seeing over and over again, was people connected to Salt Creek historically over time. Um, so I want to kind of end this talking about how does this kind of fit into some other um, context and historical ideas. Um, so from an academic perspective, most of my historical research has been done in archives um, through um, physical documents that exist. And most of the oral histories that I have used have only come in forms of transcripts. That there might be a CD or a DVD exists and I might look, hear it, but then I'll actually go back to the transcript to refer to it. Um, and so I've really been stuck in this traditional um, mindset of if I can't write a book about it or write a journal article about it, then is it really historically important or valid to me as a professor? And so what I've had to do is with this project be able to say, okay, there's history and we can actually link history to broader projects. And so to be able to see these images reflecting the stories of the people both through the murals and the photography, for me it's really made me rethink oral history. <clears throat> The other thing that happened is that um, this last March, I went to Tucson, Arizona um, for a performance that I um, saw. <coughs> um, and a lot of this is, it's not just history, but it's also thinking of this in the context of American studies and also Chicano studies. So we'll say, what do you do with these oral histories once you have them recorded? Because if you wait for a historian to use them as subject material, it could take you 20 to 100 years, okay? Because my book, which I just finished in 2014, the idea came in 1994, okay? So professors and historians are not quick at turning this stuff around. Um, <clears throat> so in March, I went to Tucson because there was this presentation of a play, of a, um, play or a teatro um, called um, La Calle. Um, and La Calle was actually based on oral interviews that one of my graduate school colleagues did in the late 1990s and the early 2000s. And she interviewed people in Tucson, Arizona, who their community had been destroyed when the city of Tucson came in and wanted to build a convention center and through eminent domain actually removed a Mexican American community. So she recorded all of these oral interviews in the early 2000s that served as the basis for her dissertation and then her book that came out in about 2007, 2008. In about 2012, a playwright from the community came to her and said, we want to take your oral interviews and we want to change them into monologue pieces for outdoor theater. And so we want to take the story of La Calle about a Mexican-American community that was destroyed in Tucson, and we want to take those oral interviews and we want to perform it in the physical space that had actually been destroyed. So in March, I went to this performance, and this was an oral interview that they had transcribed and then printed on a sheet, hung it out on a clothesline, and it was the next like three or four other sheets like this. And so when you stood back and saw this, there were the words written there, but it would also flap in the wind. So for me, it was this moment when it was like, oh, this is how you can actually bring oral histories back to life and not depend on the historian or the academic to come back to these in 20 or 30 years, okay? <coughs> They also did, so it wasn't just the sheets, but they also took um, these oral interviews and turned them into monologue pieces. And so this was actually my friend from graduate school, and this was a girl that was portraying her. So the interview was taken in like late, in like 2010 or 2011. 
And but the little girl talks about, she says, oh, when I grew up, I actually went and built, um, I was an electrician and I built um, buildings in Los Angeles. I was actually one of the people who helped build, built one of the tallest build, buildings in LA. But as we were watching, it was this little girl talking about her future, but then it was also the monologue was from about her talking about her past. Does that make sense? Um, and then the other thing that they did is then throughout the monologues, then they wove in this broader narrative about the importance of grandmothers and of community. And so this was um, puppets that the teatro or the theater group had actually um, put together and then kind of ended it talking about the importance of preserving history, preserving, per, um, importance of preserving culture. So for me, it really has made um, this idea of oral history much more tangible instead of thinking about it as I need to be able to present this in an academic setting. It's more about how do I use oral histories from the community, but at the same time return them back to the community. Um, and so what we're going to start working on right now is we're actually going to have our students then take these oral histories and then turn them into museum pieces. So that's the projects that I'm working on now. So any questions? Just ask, yeah. So I, I decided I'm done, right? For this project. Yeah. Well, what, are the, what are the important historical undertones you found? Because obviously with oral histories, you find, although maybe the story told by the, act, the person's memory, but there are accuracies or historical evidence that you can pull from. <coughs> Right. So the things that came across more important, most important in this project um, that I thought were this, that community piece, and I think it's more about the, the mural um, more than anything else, is that we saw commonalities across time. Um, and that the, and it was stuff that we knew, right? Um, but it was just kind of reaffirmed to us, like this idea that the Salt Creek Rent Center was the central gathering place. Right? And that came up in all 35 of the interviews. And for me, it was this idea of, it's not about right now. right? It's in 100 years, because Salt Creek probably isn't going to be around in 100 years. But in 100 years, to understand that this Mexican-American community that comes to Pueblo in the 1870s actually maintained this community feel for 140 years. And even today, that it still exists today. So I think that, that community piece and being able to say, Mexican-American history and culture definitely revolved around um, central locations around community. When the Salt Creek Rec Center was built, people in the community actually had to make their own adobe bricks and bring it to the community center. So it was everyone building adobe bricks, bringing it. So it was truly a community space that was organized. Um, I think it was also the stories of the ojito, of this idea that before they were able to dig wells, there was a communal gathering place for people to come to to get water. Right? And I think it's really important because when we, today when we live, we have so much artificial landscape that we don't think about what how, how did people get water 100 years ago and the fact that communities existed around water. We don't have that same feel today, right? Like there's churches that you go to and you have a community space there, but we're very detached from our environmental landscape. So it wasn't just about environmental discrimination. It was that the environment was central to um, these people. I think also the fact that you, um, that these kids knew that the black water was bad they didn't know it was contaminated, but it was something that the communities just lived with. And I think it's really relevant to today because this is still discussions that we're having in our nation, right? Is that there was a Flint, Michigan water crisis where water wasn't clean for people. It's the whole North Dakota pipeline of saying, okay, what do you do when you're on a Native American reservation and they want to run an oil pipeline through the reservation, right? Is that how do we deal with these issues of environmental contamination today that end up being affecting minority groups and people that are lower classes, right? So those were some of the things that kept coming up. I think it was also the fact that communities want to tell their stories, but they just didn't know how to do it, right? Or they didn't have people, outsiders saying, your story is important. And that's one of the other things that I've realized as I started to do this oral history and this oral research, is that when you come to a community and say, I'm interested in telling your story, at first they don't want to necessarily have input. But the more that they see you as someone that really wants to authentically reflect their story, the more willing they are to contribute to the dialogue. Um, I think for me, the best part of the project was being able to say, 
like I'm not a public historian at, at all. I'm very traditionally trained in an academic perspective, like I said, research and writing, presenting at formal conferences. But what this did as an instructor is it made me rethink what I do in the classroom. And instead of assigning traditional history papers, I'm now assigning museum exhibits or I'm assigning oral history projects. And I'm forcing myself for my students to think about how do you apply the history? So that everything that we did for this project was something that we would do as an academic historian. We did the research, right? We just did it in the form of talking to people instead of going to the archives. Um, instead of looking at oral histories, we actually recorded the oral histories. Instead of writing it down, we had to think, how do you portray this in such a way that community would actually want to see it? In the actual exhibit, there's very few things that are written down. And that, for me, was, that was so difficult for me, right? Like these little plaques right here, all they have is little pieces from the interview, right? Like I'm used to a museum exhibit, like half of this, this would have been writing, right? And then maybe a picture. And so I really had to suspend a lot of my own perspective on history and say it's more about how it, it, it that it's aesthetically pleasing than about making sure I tell the story the right way. Does that make sense? Um, but again, it was also saying, like, for my student population, because again, this whole project started with a student from the community saying, I want to tell the story. And so for me, it was saying, all right, how do I as a professor help you to tell the story that you want to tell? And throughout the whole project, because and Jose and I still, like, he's graduated everything, but we still work together on different projects. But it was about me saying, this is your story to tell. I'll help facilitate. I'll help work on it. But Salt Creek was never my story. And sometimes as a professor, when you're looking for research topics, and even for students, you want to find that research topic, right, that's really, really authentic, that's going to be this award-winning book, or that you're going to be recognized for the research that you've done. This wasn't about it at all. This was about, here's a story that a community wants to share. There's a space to be able to do it, and just do it. Like, if you look at the opening exhibit, my name's not even on it. Like that's all the stuff that I, as a professor and as an academic, just had to suspend and say it's not about me. It's all the community part. Like hopefully it shows up. But the first slide, it didn't have any of our names on it. Um, and so what it came about is like it's about that community. Um, in this process, what happened is Jose, because he'd already spent four years working in the university archives. Um, our university had an opportunity to send five students to the Smithsonian for a month. And Jose was one of the students that went. Um, but the reason he was able to go is when you actually look at his resume, there's been all these different projects that he's worked on me, with me on. So his, when his resume went to the Smithsonian, it wasn't just, okay, I work in the Rawlings Library or work at El Pueblo History Museum. He was actually able to say, these are the museum exhibits that I've worked on. Um, <clears throat> he'd also done a lot of work with digitization, so when he went um, to the Smithsonian, he actually processed more materials in a month than they'd had any intern process in 15 weeks. So it was a good opportunity for us to be able to show to the Smithsonian, this is the kind of applied history that we're doing. So I know that was a long answer, but tons of stuff I'm learning. But again, it's this idea that there's so much stuff that you can do with history that it doesn't have to be a traditional teaching degree. There's tons of museum work out there. There's tons of library work. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're at BYU, so I can sort of make some of these parallels in, of course, about religion. But when I was reading one of the articles that we were asked to prepare for this, uh, it talked about how in um, academia, there's sort of this dialogue and a lot of disagreement between the validity and the success of oral um, like archiving, right? And how it's helping students you know, learn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. by the work that they had done interviewing. It really resonated with my mission experience in Eastern Europe because I felt like I'd walk into some of these older people's homes and they'd just spew about their stories. Their stories. Right? And, uh, and not only did it teach me a lot, but it like ingrained in me like a love and a passion mm -hmm. to care for that community. I mean, why, why is academia <coughs> Um, so I'm less religious now than I was when I went to BYU. 
Um, but when I originally went to BYU, um, my entire research is actually all family history. So um, my dissertation is actually on this coal mining, not Salt Creek, but it's on CFNI, which is the steel mill that's right next to it. But my grandfather worked at CFNI, and my great grandfather worked at CFNI, and my family came to Southern Colorado from Northern New Mexico to work at CFNI. Um, and so I have always written about my family history. Um, but for me, I never admit it. Because in academia, especially in history, it's this idea you need to have to stay objective. And so for me, the advantage that I have is that within the context of Chicano studies or Mexican American studies, in American studies, you can write about your personal bias in the beginning, right? So that um, in the beginning of my dissertation, I actually say, this is my family story. Um, and there's a great historian, her name's Maria Montoya, and she teaches at NYU. But she wrote a book called Translated Property. And she actually, in her introduction, writes about the fact that she's telling the story of her community. Um, the play that I went to, the La Calle, my friend in graduate school, that's actually her family story. right? So people are able to write about the personal without necessarily showing it to the rest of the world. The reason is, is that it's an idea that you want to have this objective approach. Because the idea is, if you can come at it objectively, then you're telling the truth. Um, the argument that I've come to more recently is that what happens is professors that are historians, they don't usually teach in the communities that they grew up in. Okay? And this is just the way the academia is. Okay? So that when you, I graduated from BYU, I applied to four or five different um, graduate schools. I ended up getting to a program in Arizona and I got to study with exactly the person that I wanted to because professors, we don't, we move and we get a job wherever we can, because that's the reality of the job market. And you kind of make your life there. Um, <clears throat> but for me as a historian, to live in the space that my family's lived in for 150 years, and the space that I do research in, I've been actually able to see things change over time, right? So I sat on the Ludlow Centennial Commission. The Ludlow um, Commission actually um, is focused on a massacre that occurred in Colorado in 1914. My great-great-grandfather lived in the town when it occurred. Um, I've done research on it, and I've been to memorial events, right, for at least the past 10 years. Um, I've met the descendants of people who died at the massacre. And so for me as a historian, not being objective has allowed me to hear stories of people that aren't necessarily reflected in the history books. And so for me, it's become very aware that historians don't always get it right. And even in trying to be objective, you're leaving out important stories. And so being able to focus more on the memory of an event and how it impacted a community rather than saying this is exactly what happened. You pad get past the objectivity and say history actually matters to individuals today and they're not going to be subjective about it and they don't need to be. Does that make sense? And to be able to say like this, this stuff impacted people spiritually. Does it make sense? And I think like that's the piece about the Salt Creek Memory Project, is that it becomes a very spiritual, emotional experience for the people participating in the oral interviews. And regardless of like, this is this thing I come back to, and I have, I have thought this for a long time. I mean, I've thought this probably since I um, first attended BYU. But I think this is, maybe at BYU it makes the most sense. Um, I was always frustrated when people did genealogy because I felt like people were just looking for names and dates and they just wanted to put their family tree together and here are all the names that I have and I've researched, you know, a thousand family members. But for me, I never felt like there were stories behind it. And so it would always frustrate me because for me, I wanted to tell the story. I wanted the people to live again. Um, so what I've told my students is I said, I, I have this theory that when you are looking at these oral documents, or you're looking at these oral archi these archives, that when you talk about people from the past, it allows them to live again. And that that's the importance of telling the stories. It's more than just the name. But wherever they are, that when you say their name, when you tell their story, that that's when they live again. All right? Thank you.